So here we are. You are sticking the paper to hold it down to this glass. This is an acrylic uh, box, actually. Acrylic box? So the theme for the whole thing, well, my theme was stationary. So I decided to build it out of things that were as cheap as I could. And I went to Muji in London. I bought myself two uh, aluminium rulers, uh, a couple of wooden ones, one of which you can see here. So wood ruler, two uh, aluminium? Yep, and there's a little bit of an acrylic ruler that I've uh, smashed up to uh, make my pen holder. And then this is um, an A5 acrylic uh, paper holder box. So that's all the hardware um, that supports it. And then I also have three servos, which are about 10 pounds each, and one Arduino. So these, these are the servos, they're standard RC hobby servos. Uh, they're actually for Tarba S3003. Um, and underneath there is an Arduino, which is an Arduino Demo Novo. Slightly old bit of kit these days. And a USB to power. And, and you, yeah, so USB provides all the power um, and all the control signals. Um, so this is my program that I've written. Um, I'm using the Formata library on the Arduino, so that handles all the inputs very simply. And then I've written a little processing sketch here, which uh, will take a JPEG image. Um, so um, this is the one I this here's one I made earlier. Um, I'm using an image from the Lyft website. Um, so I drew. Oops, no more internet. I, I drew Ben Bashford, okay. yeah. who was uh, one of the speakers earlier today. Um, so I just literally saved this JPEG picture here, yeah. uh, put that in my folder, uh, and then uh, so you can see in my Arduino, uh, in my processing script, Ben JPG. Take Ben. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Ben, and yep. then it. What and then does it do? we press run. Run. And what it will do now is um, it communicates serially to the Arduino. Yeah. So it sends it one instruction at a time. Yeah. Um, everything it needs to um, to draw it. To draw it. So you would point it so it, yep. it touches the paper. Uh, yep. So the pen should move up and down, but it isn't at the moment. Okay. <laughs> but uh, you have some examples, right? Uh, yeah, I have some yeah. Uh, some examples. So you were drawing now. on the stage before. Yep. And uh, so this is this is my demo reel. For, oh, there we go. And so yeah. No, it's moving up and down. So it's every pixel, or how does it So it, it draws every pixel. Uh, the resolution is approximately 160 by 160. This is awesome. How long will it take? How long will it take? Um, to draw this, it took about an hour and 10 minutes uh, to draw the picture. It just does the whole thing it just automatically? It does the whole thing pixel. So here's, here's one I made earlier. Um, so this is, this is actually drawing lines. So it keeps the pen on the paper until it reaches an area where it doesn't draw, and then it lifts the pen off. Whoa. So, and you can see that the, the two arms of the robot are not yeah. quite aligned. So They're not quite gives, aligned? That gives you this slightly strange effect where you get dots at the top, and then kind of more stroke, stringy out lines at the bottom. So it's in full motion right here, it's doing the whole... No calibration or what? Um, I did some calibration. The, the processing script has some constraints on it. Yeah. Um, so I defined an area in which it can draw. Um, and that was quite a painful process because I drew quite a lot outside and I broke two of the motors in the, uh, okay. whilst I was doing that. So how expensive is this whole setup? The whole setup? Um, it was probably about £20 sterling for all the stationary accessories. I bought a few things which I didn't use. And then the servo motors are ten pounds each, so thirty pounds, and the Arduino uh, between uh, fifteen and uh, twenty-five pounds. So altogether, probably sixty pounds sterling. So you have uh, a replacement for the printer with a drawing pen. Uh, well, are you going to post the software online? A first prototype. Uh, yeah, I plan to release um, all the software, the uh, the sketch that I've done in processing, and the code for the Arduino. Um, I'll put it all on my blog uh, when I get home tonight. So, what do you do? What do I, do? I work at CERN as an electrical engineer in my day job. Electrical engineer, yep. so what does that mean? Um, it means that um, typically I work on the power supplies for the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, whenever anyone wants to install a new power, a new piece of equipment, say a monitor for the beam or um, a new rack that uh, looks at a different type of uh, signal that they're getting from the machine, uh, they'll call my boss and he will ask me and we will put in a power supply, uh, socket outlets, cables, uh, UPS, transformers, uh, everything kind of from a 13 amp socket, or uh, I guess it's a, yeah, it's a 13 amp Swiss socket, all the way up to a 2 megawatt transformer. 
two megawatts transformer. Yeah, you go there, you plug the stuff in. Uh, yes, well, we have our contractors wire it up. Uh, no, well, uh, contractors, we, contractors do the work, um, yeah. and uh, the CERN staff are predominantly the supervisors. Um, so we do the design, uh, we supervise the contractor whilst it's being installed, and then we do the final commissioning. So we make sure that what we've got is what we asked for, and that it works. You calculate stuff to make sure it's going to yep, work? Yep, I do uh, cable calculations. I spend a fair proportion of my time doing that. So we check that we have the right amount of energy being provided, that it's going the right in the right places, we check that the cables are correctly sized. Um, it's a very interesting and challenging job. Uh, the best part of my job is uh, that I have a, a standby shift once every six weeks. You have a what? A standby shift. So uh, we have a, a list of three guys uh, from our team um, across the whole of the electrical engineering department uh, who, who are on call. Uh, and when the LHC breaks down or any other part of the Sun complex, because Sun has um, I think we have uh, in excess of uh, 30 or 40, or even maybe, maybe I'm way off with that number, a large number of smaller experiments and smaller accelerators. Um, whenever we have a problem on anything that's experimental, uh, the phone for the standby guys will ring. And uh, so I get a call at midnight or 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's the LHC, so I have to jump in my car, grab my tools, and uh, we go down into the tunnel and uh, fix the problem. And you think that's cool? I think that's fantastic. I know a lot of my friends would... Uh, we do that job without being paid, uh, so I'm very privileged. So let's check the status here. It's still going back and forward and drawing. Drawing so, one pixel at a time is very slowly, yeah. uh, very slow. It'll take about an hour and ten minutes to finish this, based on how long it took last time we drew the same picture. Um, I had a little um, uh, 30 seconds of fame at, uh, at the lift conference uh, earlier today. Uh, I, I just brought it along to show the other volunteers and some of the other slightly geeky people here. Did you show uh, it at CERN? Um, I showed it to my boss, actually. Um, uh, he, he quite enjoyed it. What did you say? The other, th the other thing that I've done with it is, at the moment you see it drawing a JPEG picture, which is kind of the latest use case that I found for it. Yeah. And before that, I had it set up so it would track the mouse. So, track the mouse? So the idea is you, you have a, a frame, and you click in the frame and the pen drops, you move the mouse around, and the pen will physically follow. So you can draw by hand using the computer. Um, but that was just really an intermediate use case so that I could calibrate it, so I could draw the limits of where the pen moves to. Um, and at the moment, I'm using JPEGs. And ultimately, one day, it would be nice to have a, a proper printer driver. So you could put it, you could print to it rather than printing to a JPEG and doing screen capture. The Arduino community is like, they have forums, they have all these kind mm -hmm. of stuff, so you yep. can just submit it and say, hey, check it out. Yes, um, the Arduino community is, is fantastic, uh, and the, the device itself is uh, uh, a revolution. Um, the fact that you can prototype things like this, I, I think it's probably taken me about three days. Uh, three days of work. Of work to, to get this far. But you did it like uh, as a hobby. Spread a, as a hobby over yeah. a year. And so, what interests you in technology? Uh, for example, CERN has a lot of power cables, right? And you work in that. Yeah. CERN has like a, a large how number many of power cables. Billions of miles. Um, kilometers. I, I'm afraid I couldn't put That's a figure on it. Um, and basically, you are in charge of those. Um, or some of those it's within our department, uh, there, are, there are two types of cable at CERN. Um, so, my department, we look after power cabling, um, which is, is probably about maybe 30% or it's, I would say it's under 50% of the total amount of cables at CERN. The majority of cables at CERN are experimental cables. So people have detectors, and those detectors are wired up to processing racks, which are wired up to computers, which are wired up to more computers. And so we have a very large amount of um, copper data cabling, um, which is used on the experimental detectors, things like Atlas, things like CMS. Um, and we also have a huge amount of fibers, um, which are used throughout. So we have devices in the tunnel that are connected via fiber. And one of the reasons why we use fiber is because we, um, we use a system called Blown Fiber. Um, as, we, as I was coming to CERN 18 months ago, we were just looking at using a Blown Fiber system on a residential project uh, because it was cheaper. Uh, but the uh, for No, for data, data communication. Um, one of the advantages for CERN is that because we have a high radiation environment within the tunnel, we can use blown fiber to lower the fiber in without having to send humans into the environment. And then when the fiber is irradiated, we can blow the fiber out and replace it with a new one that has perfect properties. Um, wow. So that's an example of a technology that's, that's really well suited to CERN. Um, but actually, it, it comes from the telecoms industry. 
the telecoms industry have been using it for uh, at least a decade. So all these cables are being changed regularly? Uh, we have a program of cable changing. Um, how, long, how long does it take to change them? Um, I think it, it takes kind of about three months to refurbish a point on the SPS. So the SPS is a, a smaller accelerator which feeds into the LHC. Uh, it was built in the 1970s uh, and is still an integral part of the CERN uh, accelerating machine. But how long does it take for the cables to be irradiated? Um, uh, that depends on how the machine is operated. So it could be years? Or um, so it could be, it could be years. I mean, yeah. Generally de we design for a lifetime which is uh, a number of Much years. years. Um, but it's future proof, the LHC? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we, we have plans to operate it uh, for a significant period of time in the future. And there's actually, we're already, one of the groups that I work in um, is a luminosity upgrade group. Um, so we're looking at upgrading the PS, which is the proton synchrotron, uh, which was one of the first um, synchrotron accelerators of its type. And forms the, it's the, it's the, actually the second link in the chain of the LHC. Um, so in order for the LHC to, to push the the boundaries of physics. Um, at the moment, this year, we plan to run at uh, four TeV, so four tera electron volts. Uh, in 2011, we ran at 3.5 TeV. So there's a little bit of an increase there. The design luminosity for the LHC uh, is uh, seven TeV per beam. Seven TeV, yes. when is that? 14. Um, so that's kind of a longer scale time horizon looking towards uh, 2020. And there you're in charge, when, I mean, you're involved in the whole upgrading power thing. Um, it's, it's more a question of upgrading the, um, the very small electronic components and the systems. Um, in terms of the power distribution infrastructure, um, it's, it's not a significant challenge to change the power of the beam. It's more in terms of changing the way that the infrastructure that's currently in place works. Um, so we have uh, things like beam timing, uh, getting those systems upgraded, things like uh, we have um, the magnets of superconducting. So we have a system called QPS, which is the quench protection system, um, which protects the magnets from uh, a quench, which would be um, would have a negative effect on the performance and would potentially have uh, a bad effect on the operation of the machine. So it's making sure that all those systems um, are working with a degree of confidence that the bosses, my managers, are happy with um, in order for us to push the, uh, the physics level up. The other thing is, of course, we have to be very careful with the machine. Um, it's now it's a unique machine of its type. There's no one else out that Tevatron has uh, has stopped doing physics. Um, so we have a duty of care to look after this thing. Um, and whereas we could push it perhaps you know, beyond what would be prudent, um, it's much better to take our time uh, and to make sure that we move forward on a, at a steady pace rather than going too fast. So CERN is a fun place to work? CERN is a fantastic place to work. The best? Um, one of the best? It's definitely the best place I've worked uh, so far. Um, although occasionally it, it can be pretty hard work. Um, for me what makes the difference between working at CERN and working where I used to work is that at CERN there's this kind of overriding ideology. It's, it's producing new physics. It's fundamental research. Um, and that's something that it's much. I find it much easier to get excited about than uh, things like profit motive, bottom line. Um, if, if my clients who are physicists are pushing me, it's because they want to discover new things. Um, it's not just because they want to in increase the return on investment they have in this particular piece of their portfolio. Um, so it's actually meaningful. So it's, stuff. It's, it's meaningful stuff. Um, it's new things which people didn't know about before, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and, like I say, I, it's a real privilege to be able to work on that, um, even if all I do is the power supplies and then someone else does the plugging of them in and then someone else decides what gets plugged in. Uh, and ultimately, the physicists are the ones who analyze all the data and decide what exactly it is that it's showing us. Um, so, yeah, it's. Uh, so, let's it's check here the, the status. And uh, you were working here at the lift, so what, what would you say, say was the coolest things? Um, the coolest thing uh, was. Uh, was Mark Soups, uh, the last speaker of uh, the conference, and he's the guy who's building a fusion reactor in his garage. Uh, fusion reactor yeah. in his garage. Um, I actually I spoke to him. One of uh, one of the other volunteers introduced me to him because she met him, and uh, I've had had a great chat with him. Uh, he's a fantastic guy. Um, incredibly impressed with the work he's doing. It's kind of a citizen scientist, really pushing things. Um, he's working on this reactor typology, uh, the Bussard, uh, Bussard reactor which I, you know, I've never heard about uh, nuclear fusion isn't really my uh, area of expertise.
developing more into Arduinos and things that move and electronics. Um, but yeah, it's, it's incredible to think that someone can go from being a web designer to being uh, the first guy to build a new type of fusion reactor and to make it work. Um, so I'm very enthusiastic about kind of the future of this project. I look forward to hearing more about it. So is your background uh, specifically something to do with power or is it, uh, uh, what is it? I studied electrical and electronic engineering um, at Imperial College in London. So there the course is focused a lot on the electronic side of things rather than the heavy power. Um, the amount of power in the syllabus is, is not that large um, because the kind of the growth area in electrical engineering is semiconductor, it's microelectronics, it's consumer electronics, uh, high performance computing, things like that. Um, and also my syllabus that I followed had a very heavy maths component uh, rather than focusing on the practical elements. Uh, so now in my spare time I like to amuse myself with uh, practical things. You told me you thought it was an interesting thought to think about how much power is needed to store a Twitter message forever, mm -hmm. like in 50 mm -hmm. years. What can you say about that? Uh, this is something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other people out there um, looking at the idea, the phys physics concept of entropy. So the universe flows from order into disorder. Things naturally decay into a, a less ordered state. Um, the only exception to this rule seems to be living organisms where we take in energy from the outside world in order to maintain our own integrity. Um, when you take the concept of entropy and you apply it to data, uh, then you have this kind of uh, idea that in order to preserve your data, in order to access your data, you need to keep feeding in energy to it. Um, and we see it now with the idea of cloud computing, things like a tweet or a Facebook message. Uh, when, you, when you tweet it, people don't necessarily reflect on the fact that it will be stored, presumably forever, um, in cyberspace. And what that actually means is that somewhere in the world there's a computer, or two computers, or several computers, which have this message stored on their hard drives, and those hard drives are spinning uh, continuously, and they'll spin from the minute you make the tweet up until the end of human civilization. Um, and we're continuously going to need to be putting power into that. Uh, things like your old emails. I have a Gmail account. I have 4,000 Gmails. I've only had it uh, for a fairly short time. All of those Gmails are instantly accessible because they're on a data center server somewhere that's, that's spinning. Um, so my question is, when do we run out of energy to store all our information? And when do we find a way to, to store information without consuming energy? And is that even possible? Um, when you want it in an accessible format, it, you know, it needs to be online. If I do tweet something, how much energy does it take to go all the way through the internet? When everyone looks at it, if I look at a tweet, how much energy does that take? It's just an interesting um, thing that kind of I've been thinking about. You have to solve this at CERN, I think. Um, well, I think uh, CERN, having created the World Wide Web, uh, yeah. you, has, can, uh, you can solve solutions for mm. the future of the web. Uh, but I think it's uh, again, it's it's an academic problem in that there's there's no danger in. Uh, the next several millennia that we will uh, out-tweet the uh, natural energy capacity of planet Earth or uh, even the universe. Uh, we've got a long way to go before we run into the danger of having too many tweets that we don't have enough power to store them.